talk to you today about uh, new product development and give you an interesting example of uh, some of the concepts surrounding new product development that are useful for you to keep in mind should you ever be in the situation. One new product was an airplane back uh, a few centuries ago. And here's an interesting quote from a professor at the Ecole Spire de Guerre in France, which was the, uh, basically their university of war, and he said, airplanes are an interesting toy, but of no military value. So that's an interesting example of uh, the problem sometimes in seeing the potential for new products. Sometimes we see potential where it does not exist. More often than not, we often see potential or don't see potential where it does. So I'm going to ask you to talk about three questions today. The first question uh, related to this slide, when is a new product really truly a new product or just a new idea for an existing product? We tend to use the phrase new product a little bit too loosely and too commonly. A lot of new products aren't really that new at all. Later on, I'm going to talk about the fact that so many new products fail. I'd like you to think about why you think new products tend to fail so often, far more so than those that succeed. And I'm going to show you a product that was new a few years ago. And I'm going to ask you to talk about, uh, share with me your ideas on why that new product uh, solves problems for people. So, you see, we have up here products which are new to the world at the top of the slide. These are truly new products, redefine a category, something that comes into existence and perhaps nobody ever thought of this type of product before. An airplane would be like that. The Wright brothers invented the first airplane. It was brand new to the world. No one ever had an airplane before. Computer chip. Intel developed the computer chip. So before computer chips, we had tubes and circuits and very big and bulky things. So the computer chip at one point was a new product, new to the world. Printing press. Paper. So the China invented paper. So sometime in the past, uh, paper was a brand new product. Before you had paper, if you go to Xi'an, anybody in China who wanted to work for the government had to go to the places where the big uh, monuments are, marble stones, where all of the information they needed to learn was inscribed in the marble. No paper to deliver it around. So after new products, we get uh, new to the world products, we get new product lines. An initial product might be blue, but might not, might have been new, but then we simply extend that product into a number of uh, different product lines, which really aren't so new. Perhaps a good example of that would be when we think of modern computers. Uh, first we started with the desktop, and then we added laptop computers. Is a laptop computer a new product, or simply an addition to the computer line that includes desktop computers? And from the desktop computer, we, we've got to tablets and, and uh, smartphones, all of which share many of the same features. So you might think of which of those are actually new products versus products that are simply extending uh, an existing type of product into new uses, slightly different. It has significant implications for how people are going to adopt these new products, uh, how you might market them. A lot of products are simply additions to an existing product line. Um, Procter & Gamble sells 27 types of uh, hair shampoo, and they decide to offer a 28th brand of hair shampoo. Usually not really revolutionary enough uh, to be considered a new product. It's just an addition to an existing product line. Then the last three here you see on the slide, we can have simply improvements or revisions to a product. Tide detergent, which in the West is the single most popular brand of laundry detergent used by uh, mostly housewives. Tide detergent over its history has been new and improved more than 100 times. And yet it's still Tide detergent as it was back 100 and some odd years ago. Repositioned products are products that were created in the market to have a certain image and satisfy a certain type of needs or desires for the consumer. And then for whatever reason, they're no longer successful, those products. 
rather than get rid of them, the company simply says, well, let's just change the image of the product, uh, maybe make some actual physical changes, but we're going we're gonna to try to put this product in a different position in the marketplace. An example of that, the last few years I've noticed on television, is Cadillac. Cadillac has long been considered one of the luxury cars, and was generally considered a very conservative uh, luxury car. Cadillac has been trying very hard over the last few years to change its image to be a little bit more sporty, a little bit more fun and flair. And this is a significant change for Cadillac, because when you reposition a product like that, the people who want the conservative car, they're going to say, oh, Cadillac is no longer for me. But the people that want the flashier, more sporty car, now they're interested in Cadillac before they weren't. So positioning as an idea in terms of where the product is in the marketplace is actually more in the minds of the consumer than it is the actual physical characteristics of the product. But again, you know, if Cadillac says we want this to be considered a sporty luxury car, they're going to make some minor changes to it to make it feel more like a uh, sporty uh, luxury car. Uh, then finally at the bottom we have lower priced products, which is really not much change at all, but usually we found some way to make it cheaper or buy it cheaper, or market forces simply dictate that it must be cheaper, and so we lower the price and not necessarily uh, um, any other changes at all. Keep in mind though that even things like price can impact the image of a product and whether or not it's considered to be new or existing. I don't remember the name of it, but in a very famous uh, case of a French perfume that was introduced to the market as a new product, sold for maybe $20 an ounce, and was not successful. So what the company did was take that perfume off the market, repackaged it, came out with new advertising, and changed the price to $150 an ounce. Very successful. Same perfume, looks fancier, different advertising, different image, different positioning in the minds of the consumer, and all of a sudden, the smell that nobody wanted at $20, they all wanted $150. Quite interesting when you think of it. The new product development process goes through a number of different stages, starting at the top with coming up with the idea once you've established your uh, product strategy. For most companies, when we think about new product strategy, most companies have a lot more opportunities in front of them than they can take advantage of. So from a corporate strategy perspective, you have to decide what business you're in and what kind of products you want that are consistent with that. Often your decision about one product is going to be determined by how it fits with the full range of the products that you have available. Somehow or another, you have to have a strategy for deciding, do we go with this one, or do we ignore it? Procter & Gamble, to give you an example, uh, which is one of the world's largest consumer products companies, do you know some of the products that Procter & Gamble makes? Anybody, can you mention any of the names? You'll know them when I tell them to you. Well, I already have told you one, Tide Detergent, Crest Toothpaste, Pampers Shampoo, uh, Pampers Diapers, um, head and shoulder shampoo. The interesting thing about this is uh, one of Procter & Gamble's criteria for deciding whether or not to enter into a new product is they have to feel that the opportunity is there for their product to be the dominant product in the market. They won't enter a new product category if they think the best they can ever do is reach number three position. And they also have some very specific criteria around uh, the return on investment that they need to generate, as most companies do. So first you're going to have to have a strategy for picking the products, the new products that you want, and which ones you're just going to let go. Once you develop that strategy, you then start doing things to generate ideas. And by the way, each of these um, levels of new product development could be a class in itself. Uh, you could teach an entire course in creativity on generating new ideas and evaluating those ideas and how it does. So I'm just giving you the steps uh, that uh, we would normally go through. Uh, 
all these ideas, if you're doing a good job at getting ideas, then you're getting a lot of them, more than you can manage. So the next thing you need to do is have some way of filtering or screening out those ideas. We've got 20 ideas, which five are we going to focus our attention on? And usually this is a pretty rigorous set of criteria to say, this doesn't meet the criteria, this does. Thanks for the idea, but we're not going to follow it. Um, and to give you an example of how important part of the process this is, some companies, 3M is an example, uh, 3M allows all of their scientists to steal 15% of their time and steal 15% of their budget, their research budget. I say steal because since they're allowed to do it, it's not really stealing. But essentially, every research scientist at 3M is allowed to devote 15% of their resources on any idea they want to think about. It doesn't have to be approved by the company. Just any idea that they want to think about that might possibly be of some value to 3M. And I'm going to show you a quote later on that, that would tell you one very successful product that came out of just that kind of uh, situation. Pure accident, and the scientist was smart enough to say, wait a minute, this was an accident, but there might be something here, and 3M developed a very successful product. You're gonna have to do at some point or analysis, uh, some point or another, some uh, very careful uh, business analysis. A term uh, we frequently use is a feasibility study. You got this idea, but before you start spending a lot of money on developing the new product, do what you can to determine whether or not it's feasible from a market standpoint. Now, I put development and test marketing uh, there in blue ink rather than black ink, because in a future class, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about some of the details that, that go into that. Uh, I'm going to skip over them today. But we will get to them in the future. Eight out of ten new products fail. Eight out of ten. For every ten new products that are introduced to the market, eight of them will fail. This ratio hasn't really changed much in the last 50 years. So I warn you, I'm going to ask you, why do you think so many new products fail? Eight out of ten. The ratio hasn't changed in decades. And if I'm talking to you 40 years from now, first, Thanks for me still being alive 40 years from now. But second, the ratio will probably still be the same. With all the knowledge we've gained over the last 100 years, 8 out of 10 new products still tend to fail. Well, let me start you off with one of the answers. Let's go back one slide. Don't do this. And you greatly increase the chances that your product will fail. Don't have some means of screening out bad ideas. Because the thing is, in business, once someone grabs hold of an idea and devotes their time and energy and reputation and money to that idea, they don't want to let it go because it makes them look bad. So you want to screen ideas out just so people won't own them too much ahead of time. Don't do a feasibility study and you'll find your product will fail. Don't do any test marketing or development on the product. But there's other reasons. Anyone got a suggestion as to why else? Uh, so many new products fail. This is the picking button. Why do you think? They are not doing what the customer wants. Perfect. They're not doing what the customer wants. They don't fit the customer's needs. That's probably the best answer anyone could ever give, and you're going to see me refer to that a lot. You know, the way I like to put it, in fact, you see I've got it here as, a, as another situation, they're not solving a problem. If you will offer a new product and everyone looks at new products and well, wait a minute, I don't need this. I don't have a problem, so I don't need it. I don't need, I never use PowerPoint, so I don't need an automatic clicker. <laughs> okay? If you don't need an if you don't use PowerPoint or the computer, this is useless to you. You won't buy one. I like to say, people don't buy one centimeter drills, they buy one centimeter holes. If you don't need a hole in your wall to hang a picture exactly one centimeter in diameter, then you will have no use 
for a one centimeter drill. Why would you buy a drill if you don't need a hole, right? <laughs> the only reason we buy a drill is we need a hole. We have a problem, we need a hole. I'm gonna go buy a drill and solve my problem. If your product doesn't solve someone's problem, it's not gonna succeed. Anybody else have any other reason why new products fail? Advertising, promotional strategy. Okay, you know, uh, there's just, the world is full of examples where great products, properly priced, properly positioned, have failed because they just do a bad job of advertising or promoting it. People don't know about it. If you've studied any marketing before, maybe you've heard the expression uh, AIDA. Anyone ever hear this expression? Uh, in a marketing context, AIDA. If you look it up on the internet, it's an Italian opera. But I'm not here to talk to you today about Italian operas. I'm here to talk to you about new product development. What this stands for, it's an acronym. What it stands for in marketing terms is awareness, interest, desire, and action. Everybody goes through those four steps for every product that they buy, in that order. Awareness, interest, desire, action. And when you're introducing a new product, your first goal is to make people aware of it. And not only make them aware of it, but develop some level of interest in the product. If you fail at that goal, even if you have the greatest product in the world, there's a good chance your product is going to fail because of your advertising and promotion. All right, both the answers are included here. Uh, no discernible benefits you mentioned. Uh, uh, it really doesn't uh, solve a problem at all. Uh, or later on, you'll see here, poor match between the features and the customer's desires. Maybe your drill does, you know, I want a, a, a one centimeter hole. Your drill makes a one centimeter hole. I don't know, it's too heavy for me or too expensive for me or, uh, you know, it, 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 the drill bits wear out too soon and therefore I don't like it. So it's got to be more than just address the problem. It's got to be a good fit for people who want to buy it. Uh, incorrect or no positioning. I mentioned to you again about the Cadillac example and the importance of the image of your product in the minds of consumers. So uh, uh, if you do a bad job of that, if you don't tell people or suggest to them what you want their product, your product to be in their minds, they'll make their own decisions. And you may not like what they decide. So generally this idea of advertising and promoting your product isn't just to get the news out, it's to start convincing people that this is for you. And if you do a bad job of that, they won't, do, uh, they won't uh, uh, buy. Um, the features. This also could be uh, the second point about you know, not really addressing their concerns. Anything of an inferior product in quality. You notice what these are? Have you heard of the four P's of marketing before? The four P's of marketing. Product. Place. I use distribution instead of place. Promotion. I like to say communication instead of promotion. And price. So there's your four P's. If those are the four decisions you have to make, then there's a good chance that any of those decisions could lead to a success or to a failure. Finally, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there just isn't enough people who want a product. You've, you've misestimated the size of the market. Everybody who would like that product buys yours, but unfortunately there's only five of them in the world. <laughs> and you needed 50,000. So <laughs> the product fails. And uh, to be honest with you, poor time, bad luck, poor timing. Uh, I invested in a internet software company that allowed people to speak into the computer and the computer type your words. Good idea, right? My problem is I invested in it 20 years ago and it was a good idea 20 years ago but computer technology wasn't sufficiently developed for it to work well. The, the speed of the data processing and the size of data storage both were lacking. Now those stock certificates that I've got from that investment, I could use them to uh, paper the wall in my closet or something like that because they have no other value. I had a good idea, they had a good idea, 
bad luck, the timing was wrong. And here's another thing that I think you need to be aware of. It's just human nature. We're always trying to invent a better mousetrap. No matter what's out there on the market, there's always some new products coming. Somebody thinks they've got a better idea. A lot of times those ideas really aren't better. But it's just our desire to try to come up with something new leads us to do things that um, we otherwise wouldn't do. So, uh, what do you need to do to be successful in uh, introducing new products? Number one, and whatever I teach marketing, any of the students who have ever taken marketing from me will tell you, oh, Bowlby, what does Bowlby emphasize more than anything else? Know your customer. Know the consumer. There is no such thing as too much information for you to have about the people who will buy and consume your product. And probably the number one source of failure is simply not paying enough attention, gathering enough information or insights on your consumer analysis. Doing it right rather than doing it wrong and then trying to fix it later on can make a big difference. Once you get your product out there, if it's got some flaws in it, and you, let, you know that AIDA, now a million people know about your new product. Isn't that great? Here's the problem, though. They all think it's bad. So we'll, we'll fix the problem, and then they'll think it's good. Too late. You missed the boat. <laughs> okay? The boat has sailed, and you're not on it anymore because they didn't like your product. It'll be harder to convince them that it now works. Strong leadership within the uh, product development um, uh, approach is also very, very valuable to it. And generally speaking, project-based teams work very, very well. One of the most famous examples of a project-based team is Apple Computer. Before most of you were born, maybe all of you were born, they needed to come up with a new computer because, well, back up first, Apple uh, invented the, um, the um, desktop computer. Before Apple, they were all computers that were the size of this room or ten times this room. So they invented the desktop computer. IBM at the time was the biggest, most dominant company in the computer industry. They didn't pay any attention to the possibility of desktop computers. Apple invented it. Apple developed the market. IBM said, wait, this is pretty good. We should get into this business. And then before long, IBM was the dominant company in um, the desktop computer market, much bigger than uh, Apple. Of course, you know what IBM is called now? The Chinese students, do any of you know the name of the company? The, hmm? Lenovo, yeah. The IBM computers are now Lenovo computers. Okay. So uh, what Apple did was Apple decided they were going to develop a team to come up with a new computer to win back their market share. They actually set up a separate building a whole new separate team of people, large team of people, separated them from everybody else in the company. It was all very secret. They actually flew a flag in front of the building, and it was a pirate's flag. <laughs> a pirate's flag. And out of that project came the Macintosh computer. And of course, the Macintosh computer, uh, Apple has never stopped their continuing success in the computer industry since they came up with the Macintosh computer. It was wildly successful. Having the right vision really makes uh, uh, a very, very big difference. And unfortunately, vision isn't something that you can go to the store and say, uh, if we are, I'll have five vision, please. <laughs> you, know? you can't do that. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you don't have it, you never can have it. And one thing I want to mention about commitment, uh, most important, is commitment from upper management and the commitment to fail. Eight out of ten new products fail. You have to be willing to commit the resources to try these new ideas. And if they succeed, great. If they fail, we don't say, you're fired. <laughs> you fail, you're fired. Because the moment you start doing that, people aren't going to try anymore. So those are the success factors for developing a, a new product. Leadership. Here's an interesting quote. A wireless music box, which we know today as a radio, a radio has no imaginable commercial value. 
Who would ever want to send a message to nobody in particular? So the idea of radio, talk about leadership and vision, is David Sarnoff uh, at MGM Studios, uh, some of his associates were saying, don't get into the radio business. There's no, well, they didn't even call it a radio then, they called it a wireless music box. There's no market for a wireless music box. Why would you want to send a message to a million people that you don't know who's receiving the message? That was kind of a... Uh, luckily for them, Sarnoff didn't pay attention and got into the uh, radio business, so that's why I put it under leadership. Vision. Take a very close look at this. I want to ask you when you think this statement was made. Everything that can be invented has been invented. And the person who said that was the head of the United States Patents Office trying to convince the President of the United States to shut down the entire Patents Office. Why? If nothing else can be invented anymore, we don't need a Patents Office. When do you think that statement was made? What year? What year would you guess? Let's hear from our Russian contingent. What year? I assume like around the 80s. The, uh, 80s? 1980s. 1980s? Okay, okay. How about our, our uh, Turkey contingent? When do you think that this was uh, said? Beginning of 90s. Beginning of... Can you be a little bit more specific? Beginning of 19 what? <laughs> the 19th century. Is that what you're saying? The beginning of the 19th, so around 1900? Not 20th. Oh, the 20th century. Okay. Uh, how about our, our other Turkey component? Uh, 2000. 2000. This statement was made in 1899. 1899, which is now 114 years ago. 114 years ago, this man honestly believed there was nothing else in the world that could possibly be invented. <laughs> so there you go. That's what we call, not vision, but a lack of vision. Yeah. This man needs to go to the store and say, who we are, I'll have a hundred vision, please. <laughs> okay, uh, getting it right. Um, here's a read that this is a really interesting, I don't know if this is a great product or a bad product, but holiday in the United Kingdom. Uh, you know how you get in bed and sometimes it's very cold, the sheets? It's so cold. Well, Holiday Inn offers a service to their customers now. We will send someone to your room who's dressed in a fleece outfit and they will get in your bed and wiggle around <laughs> and make it warm and then they leave and now you can get in your warm bed. <laughs> I don't know how good an idea that is, but there you go. We're always trying to come up with a better most. Here. The literature is full of examples why this can't be done. 3M post-it notes, a mistake. 3M makes things to stick better. They had this batch of fluid or liquids and they decided, oh, it's no good because it doesn't stick better. But this batch had a, and they were going to throw it out, but the one scientist said it had a very unique characteristic. It would stick, but then you could unstick it. You could attach it to paper and then you could take it off the paper without hurting the paper. 3M said it must stick better. If it doesn't stick better, we're not interested. But this guy actually thought, wait a minute, this has some potential use to it. It will stick, but not stick when you don't want it to stick. And of course, post-it notes have been a wildly successful product. All out of this mistake, and this was actually his quote, the literature is just full of examples of telling us why this type of product should not exist at all. That's vision. That's really kind of opening the door when opportunity knocks, if you will. Okay, global issues. Uh, one of the things you have to think about when you're uh, introducing new products or moving into new countries is, do we take one product, say something like this, and have it the same all over the world? single product worldwide, okay? Or do we need to take a product and modify it slightly? Um, make it, uh, I don't know, a little, bit, a little bit bigger, a little bit darker, a little bit something for some countries and not for others. I think you'd probably find that other than the label, 
this would be a good example of one product that's identical worldwide, the printing in different languages and whatnot. I'm here to tell you now as a professor, though, that the chalk that is used in China is different than the chalk that is used in other countries in the classroom. Uh, so, for some reason, you don't use the same chalk here, and I'm sure you can think of many products where modifications need to be made because of the different global markets. And in some, you're going to have to have just different products, period. Yogurt here, the first time I came to China, I was surprised the yogurt is so thin. You can, like, pour it. Back in Canada, at that time, there was no such thing as thin yogurt. It was thick yogurt. You eat with a spoon. So I thought, why, why don't the Chinese use thick yogurt like we do? Because you can't eat thick yogurt with chopsticks. <laughs> so you drink it instead. It makes perfect sense. And probably somewhere in the world is a yogurt company who came to China and lost $5 million because they didn't realize, wait a minute, Chinese eat with chopsticks. <laughs> this thick yogurt isn't going to work here. So, and by the way, the world is full of examples of companies who got it wrong. Chevrolet introduced their new car, the Nova, into, um, uh, it doesn't matter what country now, but it's either Spanish-speaking or uh, Portuguese-speaking, Brazil. And I think it's Spanish-speaking. In Spanish, Nova means no go. No. no go. Is Spanish? Do you know? Uh, Spanish. I heard this. Yeah. So, how successful do you think you're going to be selling a car in another country where the car's name is no go? <laughs> <laughs> this car won't go. Okay. Gerber Baby Foods. Gerber Baby Foods, when they expanded into Africa, didn't stop to realize that in Africa, because so many people are illiterate, that almost every product has a picture of what's inside. So people will know what's inside. Gerber Baby Foods had a picture of a very cute little baby. Not many people wanted to buy that product. <laughs> and uh, in China, KFC, the most successful Western franchise company, one of their slogans is, is finger licking good. It means it's so good, mmm, 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 this is good, mmm. But when they translate it into Chinese, I mean, it will lick your fingers off. <laughs> so that wasn't very successful either. So you got to be careful in the global issues of new product development. Okay, um, the product life cycle. Quickly, I think we don't have too much time here. The product life cycle suggests that the product go through four stages. Introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. We don't have time to discuss all of the words in all of these boxes today, but you can take it away with you and discuss it. Uh, we'll discuss it in future classes as well. But essentially, the whole idea behind the product life cycle is your strategy for marketing must change as your product reaches new cycles, there are new stages in the cycle. You mentioned earlier that new products fail because of poor promotion or advertising. That's an important consideration in the early stages. Awareness and interest. Once your product has reached the growth stage, you don't have to focus on awareness and interest. The market knows about it, they're interested in it. Now you have to start focusing on other things such as the competition. And when your product reaches maturity, again, you're going to have to change your marketing strategy because it is in those mature stages. So for now, I just want to leave you with the concept of the product life cycle. We will talk about it more later. It's a very important uh, concept to consider. And it's also important to realize that this isn't necessarily for a product. More often than not, the product life cycle refers to a whole product category such as MP3 players. Not just a MP3 player, but all MP3 players. They're now in their maturity stage. In fact, we might say that MP3 players are now in their decline stage. Why? Downloading. We, don't, we download now, or we stream live on the computer. And here's another interesting quote. Decca Records, back in the 1960s, we don't like their sound. And by the way, Guitar music is on the way out anyway. This is an executive who refused to uh, record music for a group called the Beatles, which of course, as you probably still know, went on to be the most famous musical group uh, in the rock and roll history. 
Okay, uh, here's a real life example for you. This is a broom. This is a mop. Brooms and mops are so common, actually in the, the industrial research and industrial uh, classification market, there's a mop and broom category. And mops and brooms like this have been around for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, right? Thousands of years people have had in one form or another a mop or a broom. And nothing really ever changed in the market. Then in 1999, long came Procter & Gamble and introduced a new product. Unfortunately, this is not it. But it's as close as I could come. This is a sample of what Procter & Gamble introduced as a Swiffer. Have any of you ever heard of a Swiffer? This is a brand new product category in 1999. Actually, extends to, that tightens up. And there we go. Brand new product. As I say, this is not a Swiffer. I couldn't find one for today. But it shares many of the characteristics of a Swiffer. The shape, radically different than these. Radically different. And this comes down. This comes right down almost to the floor. You see that? It does, those just sit upright, kind of like that. But this one comes right down like that. Now the actual Swiffer, the material that you buy for it, is disposable. You use it when it gets too dirty, you throw it away. This is actually a microfiber. There's a replacement one with this package. Um, but micro, the microfiber can also be cleaned and reused again. Okay, so I'm going to go away from this lecture for a second. So Procter & Gamble introduced the Swiffer in June 1999. Brand new product, new category, nothing like it existed before. And the Swiffer debuted for $9.99 and they showed a bunch of army men. Their advertising was army men all in a row going along cleaning their barracks, because in the army the barracks have to be very, very, very clean. So it was a, this will really do a good job for you. So that was a TV ad. And by September of 1999, in just three months, they had uh, grabbed 25% of the broom and mop market category. $17 million in sales, North America only, in just three months. By Christmas, of 1999, in six months, Procter & Gamble had achieved $33 million in sales. In six and a half a year of this one simple but new pro uh, product. Then uh, along came a, a company, Pledge, as a major competitor of Procter & Gamble. They said, wait a minute, this is great. Let's get into this market. So they introduced the Gravit. And uh, by June of 2000, one year, after Procter & Gamble introduced the Swiffer, there were 72 different white products on the marketplace. Remember I showed you the product life cycle? Introduction, growth. What happens during the growth phase? New competitors say, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to get involved in it too. New competitors come into the market. So what happened to Swiffer sales when Pledge and some of the other companies came in? Boom. Big, big drop in sales. The Procter & Gamble, I told you earlier, insists on being in markets that they believe they can dominate, and they don't give up easily. So they introduced two new products, the Swiffer Max, larger, actually about this size in length, maybe a little bit wider, the original one was smaller, and they also, the Swiffer Wet, instead of a dry cloth, you could now get wet cloths that when you put on the Swiffer, you know, clean your kitchen floor or bathroom floor, and actually scrub some of the, the dirt stains off it. So meanwhile, uh, the name Swift, or the idea that Swift started to become a word you will see in a dictionary. Um, people were Swiffing things. And look what happened to their sales. Back up to well over $20 million by turning around with the two new products. Another brief slump, and they beat the competition again. They came up with what they call a bucketless mop. 
So we think of a mop as something that goes with a bucket and water and maybe some cleaning fluid in the water to go along with the, uh, with the bucket. So you have to have the mop, the bucket, the water, the cleaning fluid. It's just a lot of stuff to have to deal with. But Procter & Gamble came up with a bucketless mop. And I don't know how many of you guys uh, cleaned the house back home, but basically it's called a wet jet. And as you go along like, with this Swiffer, it has a container attached to it with a cleaning fluid. And as you're walking along, there's a little button you can spray, and it sprays the liquid in front of where you're going to clean. The wet, uh, the wet jet. $49.99. Very successful. Consumers really like the wet jet. So, of course, what happened? There you see the success. We dealt another serious blow. Clorox, the leading company for the manufacture of bleach. And bleach is something you use for cleaning things with. So Clorox says, we're going to get in this game too. They introduced the Ready Mop. $24.99. Not, not $49.99. Ready Mop sales caught up to WetJet in one month. And Procter & Gamble twice <laughs> had to slash their prices in order to continue to compete uh, with, um, with the uh, Ready Mop. And then sales continued to climb again. Finally, you know, as I say, it became even more cult status, the idea of, uh, of the uh, Swiffer and um, Rubbermaid, which is one of the major companies in containers and the broom and mop market, reported that the broom and mop market had dropped by 20% permanently because of the Swiffer and all the Swiffer-related products. By the way, we call that uh, a disruptive technology. When you can introduce a new product that is so disruptive that it actually eliminates the products that came before it, that is a disruptive product or disruptive technology. There's a picture of uh, some products in the supermarket uh, in Canada. Another. Another layer of products. Good five minutes. So, um, back to your point you made about why new products fail. And uh, I told you that you know if you don't need a uh, one centimeter drill a hole, you won't buy a one centimeter drill. People <coughs> don't buy products; they solve problems. Everything we buy is intended to solve some kind of problem. So the question is, my third question I told you I was going to ask you, what problems did the Swiffer solve for people? What problems? Why is it so successful? You introduce a new product and it doesn't solve anyone's problem, they're not going to buy it. So what problems did the Swiffer solve for people? Any suggestions? Well, in this particular example, you just easily can clean your flat. Easier to clean. Yeah. Okay. Easier to clean. Like the wet mop especially. Now you don't have the mop, the bucket, the water, and the Clorox. It's all right there in one thing. Easier to clean. Anybody else? Other problems? Look at the shape of this. What's different about this compared to all the things that existed for thousands of years before? Yeah, what's different about the shape that, that makes it more convenient? The shape of the surface? It's more bigger. Much bigger. It's bigger? Okay. So, uh, more convenient, bigger, more area at one time. You notice it's square corners? Yeah. How does that make a difference? You can clean the corners. You can clean the corners. You can get in corners more easily. How does the fact that... And the, and the angles are... Yeah, the, the, the turning of it. Actually, uh, Procter & Gamble developed a new mechanism, a ball mechanism for that, that is quite intriguing in how well it works. And they must have a patent on it, because this is not that same mechanism. But somehow or another, competitive companies have found out to do the same thing with a different mechanism without having to pay for the patent. So the fact that it can turn so easily in any direction, okay? What about this? What about this? I mean, if I try to do that with this, I want to keep this here. I'm going to get that handle. I'm going to break it. So how, what problem does that solve? That you can go like this. Well, you couldn't finish your campus. 
under the furniture. It goes under the furniture very far. If your uh, handle is upright only, you go under the furniture about this far and you hit the furniture. So think of it now, it's a lot faster, a lot more convenient. It gets in corners, it goes under furniture, it turns in any direction. In fact, this pro product solves a lot of problems. Problems that for 2,000 years, nobody knew they had. And so Procter & Gamble said, you got some problems and we got a solution for you. There's a really good example of how a new product can succeed so well because it solves problems. So I know I shouldn't say this to you. You want to get rich? <laughs> Simple. Find a problem that a lot of people have and find the best solution for it. You'll get rich. From a marketing perspective, it's almost that simple. Yes, you still need to make sure that you promote it properly so people find out about the product. And there's a lot of other things you need to do to make sure you're on the winning track. But if you can find a problem that a lot of people have and nobody's got a solution for it, all you need to do is come up with a solution for it and you'll be rich. Almost every successful product is successful because it solves a problem for someone. Okay? We're going to finish there in the interest of time. I had more than I wanted to talk to you about. That'll be the next class, but it's a good uh, point at which we should finish. So, thanks very much for coming today. Thank you. See you later.